Hi, everyone. Uh, this is um, Janelle Denzen, and this is the fifth week of the R for HMIS admins um, series, training series. Um, and we're going to be doing, this is uh, the sort of last one, we're going to talk about sort of how to go forward, so sort of turning you loose, but we're also going to cover just briefly like uh, some data visualization and how you would do that with, with R. Um, also, um, Carolyn is going to be co-presenting with me again today, um, a fellow R user at Cohio. Is your camera on too, Carolyn? I don't want to be the only one. Uh, I It's weirdly not letting me turn it on, so. Oh, all right. I guess well, we're on. <laughs> Well, if you figure it out. Anyway, um, you'll probably know Carolyn. Um, she's going to be helping me with the, um, the questions and, and telling me when to stop or slow down if you'll have, have questions. Cool. Well, glad to have you all back. Yeah. All right. So today we're not going to do, well, we are going to do demos, but not the kind we have been doing in the past four weeks. Um, so, but just to recount, so in week one, we did ba the basics of R. Um, in week two, we did um, R, the R Studio, as, the, as in the IDE. In week three, we uh, learned about Git and uh, various Git platforms. I think we, we used um, GitHub. Um, and then last week, we talked about the tidyverse and we used our own HMIS data um, with the tidyverse syntax. Uh, and then today we're going to talk about data visualization and some reproducibility and uh, just sort of like miscellaneous things that I just didn't want to leave out um, in this series. And, um, and then we're going to turn it over to you all to, um, if you have anything you want to share, which I definitely have. I know one person ha who has contacted me about wanting to share something. I'm going to share uh, a thing, and I think Carolyn has a thing to share. So that's three. Um, so we can keep it as short as we can and open it up to more people. Um, but anyway, so that's sort of the plan. I'm going to turn off my camera now. Okay. I'll cover. Okay. Um, but yeah, but so we're not going to be doing the kind of demo that uh, we have been in the past where we're like coding together. So you don't need like a second modern or anything. Um, as usual, please send questions to the to the questions window. Um, and I also I am going to be leaving the readme at the GitHub link that I've been um, linking to um, available for as long as people want it. Um, and I know in week three, you all pulled the uh, the slides and all of the information and sort of the the demo scripts that we had done together. You all pulled that down onto your um, to your laptops or computers or whatever into your um, your R Studio. Uh, so if if you wanted to pull again, then you would get like the updated um, the updated repo. So, um, and that's going to be finalized because I'm not like going to keep coming back and changing it. Um, and then, so yeah, we're mostly going to talk about because like this whole week, this whole sort of five weeks, I've been much, very much like contact me if you have a problem and I will help you through it. Um, and so going forward, we all are sort of our users now and we can like reach out to the, R, the broader R community and learn things that way. Do we have any questions that I needed to stop for, Carolyn? Uh, I um, answered one about um, where to find the previous recordings for this um, training. Okay. We answered with a link. The link is also in the chat for anyone who needed to go find the repo. Cool. Thanks. All right. So, well, in in the spirit of sort of how do you you know, the broader R community that I was talking about. Um, so 
just to give you sort of the landscape of what, like at least my interpretation, of course, somebody else would present it differently maybe, but um, there's definitely sort of a base R and a tidyverse syntax sort of polarization a little bit, but it's not negative. Like it's just some people prefer more base R stuff and some people stick more to the tidyverse. A lot, most people I think do both and it everybody's pretty chill about it, but there are a couple of, you know, blips on the radar where people have a little kerfuffle. But anyway, just so you know that. <laughs> um, and then as, as I've mentioned before, R is free and open source. And that creates a certain dynamic where there are developers who know R very, very well, the internals um, and how it relates to all the languages that it sort of comes from. Um, and they are generally not paid. So, um, it kind of becomes unsustainable um, if it isn't um, if it isn't tended to, let's say. Um, and so then you have our studio, which is a corporation, but it is a B corporation. And if you want to know more about that, you can um, the the last our studio conference in January uh, that I'll probably ever go to again. Um, but anyway, um, the plenary was by the um, CEO of our studio and he uh, sort of that's where he announces that our studio became a B Corp and he explains what that is and why that's important if you're interested in that I would recommend to go watch it um, is really good um, but anyway our studio maintains the tidyverse and things like shinyapps.io and sort of server um, evaluated value added services kinds of things um, and that's sort of where they make their money um and the good part of that is they also contribute a lot to the maintenance of r as a language and so the reason i'm telling you all of this is because it kind of helps to know that r is free and open source but it has like a sustaining force um within the community right um so anyway for what that that's worth Um, so yeah, more bottom line, how do I get help if I have an issue? So I sort of uh, put this list together in order of how I do it, um, the easiest first. Um, so basically, if I'm ever hitting a wall, I will just read the R documentation. If you just type a question mark and then like the function name, you can read the R documentation and a lot of the times your answer is right in there. Um, if that doesn't do it for you, um, you can always try your hand at Googling. Um, you'll um, uh, the best way to really do it because you know R is obviously a difficult thing to Google, being that it's just a letter. Um, but if you paste your error message in, um, and I found that putting R at the end of searched terms does work, um, and Google does kind of recognize that it is a, it's more than just a letter. Um, and then another way to do it is if your error message is stemming from a particular package, you know what that package name is. Um, you could also search based on the package name. So like dplyr will pull up much more focused results than say, you know, whatever it is and then R, right? Um, and also, also you just, when you're Googling, you will often find your answer. Um, you'll wind up on Stack Overflow a lot and honestly, I rarely have to go um, past step two here. Um, another way to get help is um, on Slack. You can find groups for your, your local R ladies chapter. If you don't have one, you can either start one or you can um, join the R ladies. There's a rural one and there's also um, an R, R ladies community, which is just everyone associated with R ladies. Um, so they have help channels there. Um, there's also one on Slack called for R4DS, which is the R for data science, um, sort of learning community there. Um, and then there's the HMIS help Slack, uh, and there's an R learners channel there where you can access a bunch of people who understand what data you're working with <laughs> and are using R. So that 
and that's probably a really good place to go um, since we will kind of understand each other better. Um, and then only twice I've had to ask a question on our studio community. Once was actually my fault and kind of embarrassing, but they were very nice both times and I didn't have to go any further. If you have to go further than that and go to Stack Overflow, um, well then, th this is my advice. <laughs> Um, and, and you should use this advice for posting uh, your problem anywhere, really. Uh, but um, you want to follow guidelines on whatever site you're posting to. Um, most sites have sort of a series of questions to ask yourself before posting. Um, and include all the information that you think might be helpful to the person that's trying to help you. Uh, and, and remember, the person is trying to help you, you know, is just doing this because they see it and they want to help you. I mean, depending on where you are, but for Stack Overflow, that's certainly true. Um, and so this third one though, I wanted to, to cover a little bit. Um, it really helps to create a reproducible example of your problem. So without sharing any, um, obviously, personally identifying information, um, you can build yourself a little data set and it doesn't have to be as many rows as the thing you're working with, right? You can just make it, as large as it needs to be to get the point across. Um, and then, you know, run it and try to reproduce that error. And if you can, and that's then that's called a reproducible example. Um, there's a reprex package that helps you do this. Um, and so if you do get to this point where you need to ask for help, you could uh, look into this reprex package and create yourself a little reproducible example to um, help others who are trying to help you to help you. So if anybody uh, on this call today um, was also at the NHSDC in the fall um, and went to the R Markdown and Reproducibility talk that I did there, um, this was sort of like the main, I just went and stole the main slide out of that presentation. <laughs> Um, just to sort of talk about like how uh, using R helps you move along on the reproducibility spectrum. And so if you, just to sort of explain what reproducibility is, um, if you have on one side of the continuum, 0% uh, reproducibility, you're really talking more about just, they're calling it advertising, um, which is just text, uh, text, right, like uh, narrative, and the final results only. Um, and then you move along the reproducibility spectrum, and you have science at the other side of that. And that, you can you have access to the text or the narrative or whatever, um, and the results, but you also have the code and the data. So um, they have this as a spectrum because, so for instance, HMIS data analysts, we can't share the data, but um, we can do our best to, ever, to do everything else. So like we can't get to 100% reproducibility, but we can do better than zero. Um, so that's sort of what that talk was about. Um, and so just to lay out sort of how that uh, translates to what literally what we're doing as HMIS admins. So like the best case scenario for us um, would be like as raw as possible coming out of HMIS. So you're so if we're talking about, for instance, the HUD CSV export, that has a set of specs that goes with it that was created by HUD. And so um, anyone on this call that is on a different vendor than me, right? If their HUD CSV export is coming out of their HMIS product and then I compare mine to theirs, it's gonna be different data because we have different clients, but, <clears throat> but um, it'll be in the same structure, theoretically, um, assuming that our vendors, you know, coded the, the export correctly um, to, to the specs. But it, you know, theoretically, all of that should be the same. It's the same data structure, same specifications. So it's already documented. So we don't need to document anything if we're taking it directly out of HMIS from the HUD uh, CSV export or from any of the other ways that data can come out of your 
HMIS in a sort of exporty way, like um, the APR uh, download where you get all those CSVs. That, like, I wouldn't call that raw data, but like, it's what I mean. <laughs> Um, because it comes out in a specific format that's already documented by HUD. And so that is a, a piece of documentation that you don't have to do. So that's, that's uh, the first part. Um, the second part is if you, you take that data and then you shape it in R uh, and you're documenting all that with Git. So that's referring to our week three uh, session where we saw that like you have a script, you're putting it out to GitHub, you're making changes every day and you're documenting what those changes are on which date and you're commenting on every like sort of change that you make. Um, that's already like, like automatically being documented for you. And so then finally, if you also are doing data visualization in R, well, that is also getting documented with Git as well. Um, so this is like sort of the best case scenario. It's not 100% reproducible because a number of reasons. One is not every piece of data that you're gonna need is gonna be available in the HUD CSV export, you know, potentially, or whatever export that you're using. You might need to fold in other data from HMIS that you, know, you also would need to actually document on your own. Um, another way, Oh, I thought of another way that it's not. But anyway, I'm just saying like, you. Can, oh yeah, the other way is that you can't share the data. <laughs> um, like nobody can like reproduce exactly what you did because they don't have access to your data necessarily. Um, so for if we're, if we're going for mid-level <laughs> of reproducibility, um, so we, were, we would still sort of do as raw as possible coming out of HMIS. And then we'll do our data shaping in R, documenting it with Git and GitHub. And then if your data visualization tool has a way of um, outputting what your code was, so say you you're, you're using a clicky, draggy, droppy type of uh, software, but somewhere in the background you can like download code for that. Well, if you have that and are sharing it, then that's pretty decent. Um, but it just adds like sort of another step. So, but it's still like, a pretty decent level of reproducibility, right? Um, and then lowest level of re reproducibility is you have data coming from a custom report in your HMIS, uh, which you either did not document or you documented it, but you've made a couple of changes since then and you didn't update the documentation. Um, and so it's kind of hit or miss. And then to make matters worse, you have to do a th few things to it in Excel before um, Tableau, say, or some other like a data visualization software will read it correctly, right? So those steps, if they're not documented somewhere, that's another um, missing step in your process. Um, and then, yeah, the data goes and then into the data, the data visualization software, and there's no really documentation for what's happening there either. So the, the reasons you would want reproducibility and you may not, I mean, if you're the one doing everything, then, you know, but, uh, you know, people come and go and the next person to come into your position might really appreciate um, a, a reproducible workflow that you might be doing. Um, so these are just ways that R and R Markdown, well, and really R in general and Git and GitHub really help you toward a more reproducible workflow. Are there any questions about that? Do I need to stop, Carolyn? Nope, looks like we're good. All right. So moving on to um, data visualizations. So there's, I divided these slides up into uh, first building the data visualizations and then secondly, sharing them. Um, so, so there are a bunch of packages that are available um, to build the data visualizations in. Um, ggplot2 is a major one. Uh, Leaflet is for maps. I know for HMIS admins, um, like the people that I interact with uh, when they think of data visualizations sort of in the R community, they don't really think of tables. 
so much because they're it's not very visual but i know we as hmis admins really need good tables like we like that that is a thing that we need because not everything needs to be uh like a chat a chart or a graph right so i would recommend the dt package with data table um it's very good um and then there's um our shiny which lets you create um a shiny app and i'm gonna demo one of those today and there's plotly which you'll see in my in one of my shiny apps and then there's our graph gallery which kind of um uses some gg to plot too but it also there's there's a bunch here i use this a lot actually if i'm thinking about creating a visualization i will often go here um, because it helps you think through what it is that you need like what kinds of ways you can visualize what you're trying to communicate um, so like ranking for instance or part of a whole and evolution maps flow so anyway, I like to come here and there are all kinds of um, things that that they include in sort of the possibilities that are there. Um, so then how do you make data visualizations available? Um, so like I said before, our studio um, runs uh, shinyapps.io, which um, offers a few packages. We have like sort of the mid mid-range one uh, it's not very expensive it's like a hundred dollars a month i think um, for the shiny app that i'm going to demo and and that's only because it has authentication so our users have a login to this site um, and if they didn't need that it would cost nothing to us so um that is and that is run by our studio um and then there's um, our markdown output so our markdown which is what we did in week four when we were uh, using the tidyverse to play with our hmis data um, the kinds of outputs that you can have from from an, uh, our markdown document is like an html file or word or, or just slides which is what i'm using right now like these slides are just basically html that i'm using um, and a PDF and also PowerPoint. I don't know why I didn't put that here, but the um, the NHSTC presentation that I created was built in our markdown and then um, brushed up at the end with the um, sort of more formatting and things like that. Um, but if so, the way I do things and the the way I know what what I want to use in terms of our markdown or shiny is if somebody's just asking for a one-off kind of thing or we're considering putting some data into one of the shiny apps i'll often code it first in our markdown and then like pass it around and see what people think and get feedback and make adjustments and do all that and then if they don't need anything further then it's done uh, like i just don't need it anymore and I mean, I keep it in case I need to to rerun it with a different date range or something like this. But uh, in general, I use our markdown for one-offs. Um, and so if it's sort of an interactive um, data visualization, uh, I can actually output it to HTML and email the HTML file. And that allows the whoever's receiving it to just open it in their browser and then they can interact with it. Um, it, it also will output to Word or, um, like I said, slides. Uh, you can also write books. You can also create a blog. Um, and then there's R pubs. I think Carolyn is going to be showing something on R pubs. Um, and it's just basically easy, easy web publishing from R. So, like, if I wanted to publish these slides, um, I could go to publish document and then um our pubs and yeah they're like okay this is gonna be public anyway um and then you'll get i don't know carolyn what happens after that because i've never actually published our pubs does it give it, you like a link it's super bare bones like you don't get really a lot of choices at all you just click that publishing thing like you said yeah. it's like this is public and then yeah. it gives you a link 
and you don't really i don't think you can even like name the link yourself it's just like yeah. r slash five six one oh nine okay but i think right. like you just need to get it out to people it's free and it's quick yeah yeah quick and dirty all right yeah so that that is way and if you saw in there too and this is more of sort of what um what our studio does there's also a product called our studio connect which is way more um fancy and complicated and they um, charge a lot of money um i mean in my experience i guess of what a lot of money is but um to so i guess like governments or whatever would not blink an eye but anyway they charge you know for what it is and it's i've i've heard and i've seen things uh, about what it does and it seems really great but it's just too much for us to we don't really need all that and it's a lot of money so but it is available in something if you're interested if you're for like a county government or something um might be something to look into i don't know but anyway so these are ways that you can make data visualizations available to others right and i'm going to be demoing uh shinyapps.io and uh you'll see in our pubs too. <clears throat> oh, okay. This is one of those, this is one of those miscellaneous things that I didn't want to not include because, so if you're, if you're planning to use R as an, uh, you want that middle piece of your work to be reproducible. Like you want to share code or, you know, borrow code from, from other people. Uh, using GitHub or whatever, and you want the bulk of all your sort of logic and your data shaping to be um, out there and available, um, but you don't want to use the data visualizations available through R, um, or even if you do, <laughs> this may be useful uh, to know because yeah, this is like a, a major step that I I ha always had a question about until I really really needed to know and i finally figured out the answer from twitter thank you but anyway um so basically i'm just going to show you uh what a symbolic link is if you don't already know um so this this project is uh my main like where i keep most of my stuff most of my code that's important is right here and so these scripts here all create um, what's called an image. So if you run that script, what's left over in the environment um, gets saved to an image, and then it gets saved to an image file inside the, this, this directory I created called images. And um, you can see they're all right here. Um, and then what happens is, because okay you can't so if you're in a project in our studio and you want to save the output of a thing to something that's um above your project level like if you're in a project but you want to save it like let's say directly to your c drive which is unadvisable but whatever let's say that's what you want to do i i don't think you can do that uh i yeah you can't do that you can save it directly to your project directory but you can't go above that so then how do you get your outputs outside of you know that that particular directory so the answer that i found was symbolic links and so what i did is in so for windows at least you have to go to the command prompt as administrator so if you do like cmd and then you do run as administrator um then you would basically run this command called mklink and then a space and then inside of quotes you would put the the path to where you want the um the output to to be that's outside of that you know that project's directory and then a space and then in the next set of of, of um quotes you would put the path to where uh, that output is and then you run that and it said okay symbolic link link created and so then what happens so this is the sort of where it is um, so this would be my 
path that I would put for this, right? And then if I go to my Shiny apps and I go in the data directory, these are the, the symbolic links that I create. And you can see there is a sim link and there's zero kilobytes. Um, and so yeah, those are, that is all where they, they go. And I also sim link them to my, so I have two shiny apps that I'm sim linking everything to. Um, so that's how I get my, the data that I'm shaping inside, um, inside of this project into the data that I'm using inside of this project and this project. Anyway, if, if anybody has questions about this later, just let me know. <laughs> uh, Cause this, it's, um, it's really useful, but it, it took me a minute to figure that out. Um, so what did this training series not cover that you should look into? We didn't talk about functions very much. I think I wrote one on the fly in week one, but that was in the redo. And if you're, I don't know, if you caught the first one, I don't know why you would have watched the redo. So, but anyway, um, we didn't really talk about functions as much as I would have liked. And I think they're really important because they make your life so much easier. Um, we also didn't talk about like how, um, how much we work as, uh, with dates as HMICE admins and how um, the Luberdate package works. Um, it's, it's easy to catch on to, um, but I don't know. It this it just occurred to me that like this, um, this should be mentioned as one of those things. And then we also didn't do uh, any like coding together as far as like building cool plots or anything like that. Um, but yeah, that that kind of thing would take a long, you know, like a full session and I just can't keep doing, <laughs> you know, an hour a week. Um, so this is, uh, these are the kinds of things that um, that you can go, go forth and, uh, and do on your own. Um, okay, so we were going to do uh, some demos, and I already have uh, uh, Jesse Dirkman from ICA, hopefully is um, prepared to show us um, some some cool things. And then um, I'm going to show um, the way that I've been rewriting all our old reports into two Shiny apps. And then Carolyn is, I forgot what you're going to show, is it the maps? Yep. Cool. Perfect. All right. So is uh let's see if we can unmute Jesse. Unmute. Jesse, can you can we hear you? Hello. Hi. Hi. Do you want would you like to be made the presenter? Yeah. All right. All right. If you're seeing our studio, let me know. I am seeing our studio. Okay, great. So I have two Shiny apps to show. Um, I host these on shinyapps.io. We've got the $9 a month plan. Um, yeah, and we haven't, we haven't over, gone over that level of usage yet. And we have one, one of the apps is provider facing, and then one of them is just ICA staff, one that we've started using for data cleanup. Um, so this looks like my APR app that I'm gonna start. Yeah, so this was, I had this idea and it prompted me to learn how to build something in Shiny, um, but, put this together a few years ago now when the when the APR format changed. So we used to be able to pull our APR out of our HMIS system as a single Excel document, but when the change happened to turn the APR into like those 65 CSV files yeah. contained within a zip file, um, 
it was slightly overwhelming to me and just expecting any provider to be able to pull anything useful out of that kind of file format seemed like way too much to ask. So this was a solution where they could actually use that file and turn it into something that's more meaningful to them. And there's definitely a lot of opportunity in this to make it more pretty. I just sort of got it to the point where it worked and then deployed it. But on like my list of things to do eventually is to make the graphs look nicer. But we've got an upload button here. So you grab your CSV, fi CSV zip file that comes from your vendor. I know this one works for my particular vendor. It hopefully works for other vendors. Again, like Janelle was saying, if they all coded things the same way, but it at least works for our particular vendor. But you upload your file, and then it basically just pulls the information from that APR out of those CSV files and then spits it out into this tool. Nice. So we've got some basic summary stuff on here, the name of the project, project type, total number of clients, and then a few summary stats that seemed like maybe they were worth highlighting, how many adults gained or maintained income, exits to permanent housing, that kind of thing. And I'll just quickly zip through some of these. Got some sort of ugly data completeness, data quality, visualizations. Uh, this one, I think this is one of those DT tables that you're talking about, Janelle, just a kind of a slightly interactive table. Not that there's much to interact with, but just with some basic, basic summary stats about the client served. Then we've got some bar charts for demographics, the age distribution of clients served, race and ethnicity, Nice. And here we've just got some of the other tables. So disabilities, and maybe we'll look at income sources and exit destinations. Yeah, so we've just got a, a link to this tool on our website so folks can go to the the link that's hosted by shinyapps.io and then throw their throw their zip file in there that comes out of HMIS and then they can see some quick visuals about their APR. Nice. Hey, is that behind a login that your only your users can use it? It is not. Um, so, so anyone could use this. Yeah, anyone could use it. Um, you would just need, you have to come with the data. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That is super cool. And then the other one, this is our part of our LSA cleanup process for this year. So I was definitely part of the headache last year where we had, you've got your bed inventories in HMIS, and then you've got what you submitted for the HIC, and we had like, I don't know how many errors saying your the number of adult only beds you had in HMIS don't match the number of beds that you reported in the HIC. What's the right number? And then we had like 15 different permutations of that error, mm -hmm. which was very difficult to find, find exactly which provider was causing that error and then figuring out how to fix it. So I'm hoping that this year, now that project IDs are in the HIC data that we submitted, like the process with HUD is a little bit easier, but this was like a, I'm not gonna trust them to do that. So can we kind of get out in front of some of that data cleanup and yeah. figure out how to get these numbers to match? So this is a bed inventory verification tool for our system administrators. This first tab, we've got the instructions. And I'll just sort of go through this so you can kind of see what you do. So you go into HDX, 
just select all of the columns. I don't use them all, but it's the easiest way to make sure I get the data that I need. And then you export it to Excel with some slightly more specific instructions because it comes out kind of like an Excel document, but also like an HTML document. So you have to like double save it to make sure it's an Excel doc. Um, and then we're also using, pulling a report from our HMIS that's just a super basic, spits out all of the bed inventory records for mm -hmm. all of the providers within your COC. So the first steps are for our system admins just to pull both of, the, both of those files, and then we upload them here. So I've got a copy of an example of a HIC file, and then an example of my bed inventory data. This one's coming in as an, as an Excel file. This one's coming as a CSV. And you also pick the date of your housing inventory count. Mm -hmm. Because I'm in Wisconsin, I picked the date we used in Wisconsin. There's other other COCs that I work with that had a different date. So you can pick the date that your hit count happened on, and mm -hmm. that's not going to impact the file that comes out of HDX at all, but it'll help. That's the date we're using to limit what are the records of bed inventories we need to look at, so which are the ones we need to match. So once we've got that date, then we go over to the summary tab, and we can see which categories match and which categories don't match, and what's the difference between them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, yeah, so this is just the summary tab. We see the differences, and then we've got how many providers are on the HIC, but not in HMIS, how many are in HMIS, but not on the HIC, and then which are the providers that are in both of those categories, but the number of beds doesn't match. Mm -hmm. And I've also got a selector here where you can exclude the rapid rehousing beds. Seems like the best guidance we've gotten on that is what we need to have in HMIS is slightly different than what we submitted for the HIC. I rely on my system admins to tell me that, but basically they asked me for a button to exclude rapid rehousing. So I created a button to exclude the rapid rehousing projects. But then we can go to the missing from HIC tab, find out which providers fall into that missing category yeah missing from hmis which providers are those yeah and then for the provider inventory issues this one's a little bit at first look it's super overwhelming so all of those different error categories that we saw in the lsa they're all listed here and then if a provider had that error they've got an x so just looking at this table like Mm -hmm. It's too much. But down here, you can filter to each provider. So let's just grab that first one. Uh, or maybe I'll do 8388. So now I'm filtering everything below here to just this one provider. So I can see this Women's mm -hmm. Center Refuge, they've got one error. It's an HMIS year round bed, beds error. So I'm going to look at these two, figure out where is that coming from, and it's that eight right here. We've got eight beds listed in HMIS here, and then it kind of looks like there's nothing in HMIS. So our question is just, does this provider enter into HMIS at all? If they do, then something's wrong with the HIC. Otherwise, we just have to fix this eight in HMIS, and then we'll be good to go on this provider. Nice. That looks super useful. Thanks, Jesse. Yeah, for sure. And I can, yeah, I can answer any questions, but I will pass the screen back to you. All right. Um, no questions on that one, but one awesome. Thanks. Yeah, that was super cool. Yeah, thank thanks you. for showing us. Mm -hmm. Um, do we uh, 
Let's see. Okay. Okay. All right, well, um, I'm just gonna real quick go over the two, I also did two shiny apps. <laughs> um, the reason we have two is we needed to replace all of the reports that were written in our old uh, reporting system. Some of them we wanted to be viewable by anybody, anybody, just public. And, but some of them we wanted to be only viewable by people with HMIS logins or otherwise approved people. Um, and so, oh wait, why did I close that? And so we we did two shiny apps, one which is public, which is we're calling our minor. And uh, you can see it has the shinyapps.io sort of URL. And this one is, is available to everyone. And then the other one is called our minor elevated and the elevated means that like you have to have a login to get into it. Um, because my browser remembers me and I never clicked log out, um, it's just going to put me straight into our minor elevated without asking me to log in, but it does have a login. Um, and actually, I'll show you what that's like because so if you click log in, you can use your, um, oh, <laughs> that was not helpful. You can use your GitHub login. You can use, I think it's Gmail. And then you can just have like a straight up login um, as well. So the, you know, the trick is your users uh, need to kind of deal with another login, but we thought it was worth it. Um, so our minor elevated is the one where really like most of the stuff is here. Um, and the relationship between these two mostly is that like if a user sees something that's over here and they're like where how did you come up with this like how did you get that i have 98 percent of my um my heads of household exited to permanent housing um so like you would go to our minor elevated and then go to that sort of same report and then um you can on this particular report so this is our coc competition um i'm trying not to show any person any uh, like client level data here but um you would look at the access to permanent housing and look that you had 98 percent and then um if it's a psh we're looking at all heads of household if it's if it's any of the other um project types um, we're looking at heads of household levers. And then like for all of the data under here that you can't see, um, you can enter search terms um, and sort here. And so if, if a household met the objective and is being counted toward the 53, right, people that had a permanent uh, um, destination, then this meets objective would say yes. If it says no, then they, they must have uh, exited to a different type of destination besides permanent. Um, and so then, is, you know, there's a tab, right, for each of these measures. So one for increased income, uh, benefits, uh, health insurance. And so they can see the detail at the client level um, for where all these numbers came from. Then they get a score and they have, you know, out of the possible score, and then, of course, if they have too many data quality problems for it to be scored, then it will refer them to the data quality report. Um, and then they have to go fix their stuff to, to even get a score at all. So anyway, this is our this is our like the way we rank our projects. And um, <clears throat> and the the diff the difference is so like um, the people that don't have a login to are when you're elevated. So like, like they'll say like the uh, the people that sort of run the the agency but less they're not necessarily doing hmis work they can still see like how their project is going to score in the pro project ranking um, without seeing all the client detail um, so that is an example um, another part of this that i can show because it doesn't have client level is um, our data entry timeliness um, i'm just going to put in the most they're a really busy project. So our COC looks at, uh, we expect uh, five days or less uh, for people to enter their, their, their households. 
into HMIS. And um, these people have a ton of clients all the time and they've done pretty well um, with keeping within the five days. You can see all the green there and they have a few outliers, but their median is still zero days, which is great. Um, and then, so there's a provider level one, which I'm not gonna go to because it has uh, client level data. Um, but if you go to the region level data quality, and so what happened is our, our state divided up our balance of state into regions. So like everything that's not slashed or like striped in here uh, is the balance of state. But then all, all of that balance of state is divided up into regions. And so um, a lot of this reporting is also divided up into regions, including the data quality. So if you're in region five, say, um, but you then you can see like who has the worst <laughs> the worst uh the biggest sort of problem or the needs of the most technical assistance in your region right and um but let's say you're in region five but you don't really care about ashtabula county you really more care care about portage um you can um, this is the table i was talking about the data table you can sort by these and you can also um you can type in search uh, by by column, uh, you can type in search terms. And so now you're seeing every everything that's related to Portage County listed um, and all of what their, their high priority issues are, their errors and their warnings. There's three different types of data quality problems. Um, and it's sorted by like the type and then the number of clients affected by that particular type of data uh, issue. And then if they wanted to go further than the um, just the county and they wanted to see at the um, provider level, they can search more, you know, like enter more search term and then have it further narrowed down and they can really just see like what they as a provider have as in terms of data quality. Um, and of course they can change the report start date. Um, and then at the at the Ohio level, we um, have a sort of list of projects to bother all month, and um, and this is how this is where we go to get all that information. Um, and then our quarterly performance report again is is um, mirrored. So there's no data quality on the on the public, just our minor, um, but the quarterly performance report is um, is mirrored um, kind of like that. So uh, if we wanted to see all of the regions, shelters for length of stay, and you hover over, and these, this is a Plotly plot. Um, and what's really, really good about Plotly is that you can control um, the hovering, and, and it's actually um, hovering. I, I don't think you can really hover with ggplot. Um, and then you can uh, do like, you can download it as a PNG, you can do all kinds of cool stuff with Plotly. Um, but I just really like the hovering. To me, that makes this a lot more useful. Um, again, I just sw switch it to median instead of average. Um, you can see the green um, area here is what the COC goal is for this particular measure, so length of stay. Um, and then, you know, and then if you just want to see like all the transitional housing, so you can see the, the goal change for the transitional housing. Um, and again, you can hover over the outliers and see who you need to talk to. Um, but anyway, that's that's what uh, I've done um, over the past two years. It is exactly two years, actually. I figured out that I ordered uh, R for data science exactly two years ago on Friday. Um, but just to show you too, the other thing to be aware of is um, all the code for this is available. Um, so I, like I explained before, at most of the stuff that I do is in um, Kohio underscore HMIS. That, that's the project that I keep everything in. And um, I know we, we didn't really cover functions, but I have, for instance, a script of just functions and that's all they are, that's all it is. Um, so like, this is a, a, a um, function that really anyone could use if, if you're you know, using the HUD CSV export. Um, so if a client was served between two dates or if they entered between two dates or they exited between two dates, 
or they stayed between the two dates, which, which measures from the move-in date to the exit date, unless you're a TH or an ES, then it's from the, the uh, entry to the exit date. But anyway, um, these are the kinds of functions that, uh, oh yeah, and this would let you um, like get the, if you look at your data in the HUD CSV export, you have like a bunch of numbers. And if you want it to return like what you want the what the answer really is to that, you can. I don't know, this is just something I created that does that. Anyway, um, so these are the kinds of things that are available to anyone um, that's on this. And like I said, the um, the shiny app code is also available. So the the R minor that we just looked at and R minor elevated, all of that code is out on GitHub as well for anybody that's interested in that. So I think that's it. Um, oh, we only have three minutes. Um, but Carolyn, would you like to go? And then um, if there's anybody else, I'm fine to stay on longer if other people are. Um, so go ahead, Carolyn, you want me to switch your? Uh... Sure, yeah, and if anyone needs to hop off that school, we'll just have the recording, no biggie. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to make you the presenter. Okay. I don't know how to change which screen. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. So, um, of course, I don't have it open. Which is the second. But you just had it open. There we go. Um, so, we kind of changed our methodology, methodology this year in our pit count. We um, did it with a sampling approach, which was kind of difficult um, to implement across the bounds of the state. It seemed like there was a lot of confusion, like folks were pretty used to our uh, method before where it's just like the use the entire geography and, and record to anyone that you find. This one, we, um, we narrowed it down to certain census tracts according to our, um, our vendor, which was Simtech. Why is it not loading? Of course, it was up here and it was totally fine. Now it's not loading. Oh well, I'll just keep going and maybe it'll um, anyway, we uh, needed to communicate to folks where they would be sampling, but the vendor did not provide maps for um, the sampling areas. And it was, I think we were down to like three weeks until the pit count, and we still had no way of communicating to our folks where they would be searching for, for people on the, on the night of the pit count. So um, Janelle and I had just attended an Our Ladies workshop about, oh, there was a, a person there presenting on uh, mapping. And so this is her repo about it. I, she actually took down, this is the best uh, mapping repo that I've seen. It's a really great tutorial. And she took it down, I think, because she's a teacher. Uh, and wanted to kind of keep her lessons uh, under wrap for students. But I realized that um, her mapping, I think she was mapping uh, that it's conflict in Yemen. I realized that this is like exactly the style of mapping that we needed for our hit count purposes. So it still won't load heartbroken. I can show it in our studio, I guess. Um, here is what the map looks like. Duh, I don't know why I didn't go to that first. Um, and, and highlighted in pink are the areas that we were asking folks to be sampling. Um, and we were able to just publish this to our, like, like Janelle showed earlier, the R pubs thing. It gave, it gave us kind of a dumb extension, like, or a, a dumb URL, it's like 560552, like it doesn't mean anything, but we were able to link to it on our website and show this to folks. Um, so the process was that we downloaded a CSV from the, that was provided in the, the vendor app, 
and it just gave the census tract whether or not we were sampling there and the probability of finding folks in that in that census tract. And so with those numbers, I was able to match it up with shape files from the um, from the United States Census Bureau. I cannot find the exact file that I used because their website is is amazing at <laughs> mapping um, sources, but was able to download the shape file uh, from the census website and then use this um, census track CSV to kind of match things up. I I just want to say I had no idea what I was doing. I literally just copied and pasted the code from Yemen and kind of uh, changed things and plugged our information in. Um, luckily, like there's no um, PII in here I had to worry about. I literally just did not know what I was doing and kind of fig figured it out. So if anyone's scared, like don't don't worry. You can if I can do it, you can totally do it. Um, so this is this is the code from kind of a mashing together of the Yemen uh, tutorial and and our needs. I, the thing I think that was hardest for me to figure out in this was that. Um, shape files have a lot of different kinds of information in them. Um, the tracks, the census track shape file that I got from the census website is actually the spatial polygons data frame, which sounds like total masses speak, but uh, understanding how that works, I think, was the hardest part of, of putting this together. Um, the, the important things are that um, the shape file includes something called geo, geo ID, which it's like a table inside of the shape file. So the shape file has a data frame in it. And I was able to um, join our table with this existing um, data frame in the shape file. So geo ID was the, the field that I used to map. Um, I think that. That is all I wanted to show with mapping. Cool. Any... That's awesome. Is there anyone else that wants to show us that you, something that you've done? It doesn't have to be like, so these are things that we've worked on for a long time, but in any little thing that you did, um, let me know Let me know if you want to show it. I can stay as long as y'all want. Nice desktop background. Hmm. I like your uh, background. Oh yeah, dang it. Oh, oh yeah. So while while I'm waiting to hear from others that want to show any uh, thing, um, this uh, the talk that I did on uh, at NHSDC, I knit it. I I made the output um, PowerPoint. And just if you want to see like how that turns out um, when you knit it, instead of it like what we were doing last week, it knits to just like inside of our, our studio, it knits straight into a PowerPoint. And then you can add in, um, if you have a template or something like this, you can just copy all of these slides into your template and it looks, well, I mean, it needs a little work after that, but it's pretty much ready to go. So this is the, the um, the slide deck that I used for um, the R Markdown talk at NHSDC that Carolyn helped me with it was really cool. Anyway, um, so who else? Does anybody want to share? Share more stuff? Okay. I'm going to assume that that's a no. But um, we would. Um, I would be super interested to hear of things that people are doing. And um, if you ever want to send me stuff, um, I'll be happy to see it. Um, and let's see, what? how did I, did I have anything else? Oh yeah, so the donations and then yeah, off you go. <laughs> um, all right, so I think that's it. And I really appreciate everyone's um, attendance and um, feedback. Uh, if you have, if you do have any feedback about this um, 
series, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, or if you have ideas about how we can continue to have sort of a, a sort of our user group um, amongst HMIS admins or something like this, um, let me know and we can uh, stay in touch. Thanks everyone.